Welcome back to the Crit Medic Podcast. I'm your host, Dominic Walenzak. So over the past couple of years, we've had some studies that came out and cast some shade on different EMS interventions and actually all medical interventions in the context of cardiac arrest. We've had the most recent study come out and say that maybe epinephrine might not be the most beneficial in cardiac arrest. And we know we've had the ALP study come out last year that said that both amiodarone and lidocaine might not be the most beneficial in cardiac arrest. So is it time maybe that we have a study that perhaps casts some shade on the staple of EMS, the uh, intubation and laryngoscope? Stay tuned and we'll cover that in just a little bit. So there's a couple of devices that we have in the showdown when we talk about care in cardiac arrest. And there's the most common ones that we see tend to be the endotracheal tube, the King LT, the IGO or other LMA variant, and the BVM. And sometimes in combination or in concert with all, th- all three or four above. But which one is really best for cardiac arrest? Do we, do we really know what is the optimal care in cardiac arrest? Well, there's some studies and some data that have been done on the matter that uh, may cast some light on it. So let's uh, let's cover some studies that came out here. This is by Dr. Henry Wang in 2009. And they found that interruptions to chest compressions worsen outcomes, period. And they found that in about 25% of EMS intubations, it resulted in a greater than three minute interruption in chest compressions. And this decreased outcomes. So there was a big change in paradigm in EMS care. We decided that we would not interrupt chest compressions while we're intubating. And nowadays, there's, there's no reason to interrupt chest compressions. You can pass successfully in an tracheal tube in the midst of compressions uh, with minimal or no interruption. So let's take a look at a, meta, a meta-analysis that was done subsequent to this. Uh, when they analyzed data from about 34,000 endotracheal intubations in cardiac arrest and 41,000 supraglottic airways, they found that patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest received endotracheal intubation by EMS are more likely to obtain ROSC, survive to hospital admission, and survive neurologically intact when compared to supraglottic airways. Now, this is a meta-analysis of all the other studies, so this is sort of the the compilation of all of the latest data as of 2015 on the matter. Now, they included some studies that had some, some issues as far as the outcomes that uh, leads to some questions, but overall that was the latest state of the science that we had at the time. However, there have been some new studies that came out that uh, may change EMS practice. So these new studies that came out are PART, Airways 2, and CAM. So let's talk about uh, the PART study, the Pragmatic Airway Resuscitation Trial. Now this divided patients into two groups. And for the purpose of this, we're not going to tell you which group is which just yet. We'll see if you can figure this out. So in this, Group A presented with 13.3% EMS witness arrest, which is greater than Group B. They had a greater rate of less than four minute EMS response times. They also had a greater rate of first shock of rhythms. They had a greater rate of therapeutic hypothermia. And they also had a greater rate of coronary catheterization um, subsequent to ROSC. So which of these would you suppose is the winner? Well, it may come to you as absolutely no surprise that Group A had a 2.1% greater survival with favorable neurologic outcomes. So let's let's pull back the mask. What is Group A and what is Group B? Well, Group A was the King LT and Group B was the endotracheal tube. Uh, but given what we saw about those numbers, is it really any surprise? And does that really reflect necessarily the outcomes that are driven by the device itself versus outcomes that are a result of all those other factors. 
Well, let's take a look deeper into the data here. We do know that group A had a higher rate of inadequate ventilations and pneumonitis from aspiration. So there were some limitations to this study. And the first limitation is that the trial could not assess the influence of chest compressions or ventilation quality, which is kind of strange because the same study author did the study where they found that the interruptions to chest compressions definitively decreased outcomes. So knowing that, why would they choose to not monitor that? I understand it's a pragmatic study, so it might not have access to that sort of information. But wouldn't you design a study that tends to focus on those key factors? Is this a reflection of you know, intubation that's done poorly with interruptions? Or is this actually a fault of the device itself that's leading to worse outcomes? Are these providers stopping compressions or are they continuing? We'll probably never know. And the second limitation is that the overall endotracheal intubation success rate was 51% uh, in the uh, PART study, which is lower than the 90% success rate that was reported elsewhere in literature. There was a meta-analysis that looked at paramedic intubation success rates. They found that to be around 90%. This study fell well short of that success rate. There are some interesting findings, I would say, from this study. So in the text, you will see that they did some analysis, some post hoc analysis, and uh, this was in the literature. In the as treated analysis, meaning the people who actually got the interventions that they're studying, there was no significant difference in 72 hour survival between those receiving initial King LT and initial endotracheal intubation. Oh, okay, great. So this, this study showed that there's no difference. All right. Well, what does the conclusion say? Well, the conclusion says that among adults with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, a strategy of King LT insertion was associated with significantly greater 72-hour survival as compared with the strategy of initial endotracheal intubation. Huh. That seems a little bit different from what the text said. Peculiar. So, let's take a look a little bit further here. So, there was another excerpt from here that says, in the intention to treat population, which some people would say is a more accurate representation, although I don't buy that just because you intended to treat someone, any outcome subsequent to that is as a result of that intervention, whether or not you actually performed it or not. But anyways, in the intention to treat population, after post hoc adjustment for age, sex, initial cardiac rhythm, response time, witness status, and bystander chest compressions, the difference in 72-hour survival between King LT and endotracheal intubation was not statistically significant. In a hierarchical, in a hierarchical, <clears throat> man, I can't just say that word. In a hierarchical model with patients nested within agency and agency nested within randomization cluster, and applying independent correlation structure, the difference in 72-hour survival between LT and ETI was essentially not statistically significant. In a linear regression model with randomization cluster included as a fixed effect, the difference in 72-hour survival between KLT and ETI was not statistically significant. Well, wait, maybe, maybe there's some more that, that we can look at. Well, let's see. When stratifying, when stratifying by order of randomization, LT first or endotracheal intubation first, the differences in 72-hour survival were 2.5%, uh, looking at the confidence interval, that's not statistically significant, for LT first, and also not statistically significant for ETI first. After post hoc multivariable uh, assessment, or sorry, after post hoc multivariable adjustment, the difference in 72-hour survival in the per protocol analysis was not statistically significant. So, this may make you wonder, how do we conclude the study? What is the conclusion that we can draw from this? Well, apparently, according to the study author, it's among out of adults with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, a strategy of initial LT insertion was associated with significantly greater 72-hour survival compared with the strategy of endotracheal intubation. Hmm, that doesn't seem to jive with the data that is presented to us here. 
it really seems like this is utterly an utterly unsupported conclusion here. But uh, at any rate, they're looking at a 72-hour survival. It wasn't powered enough to actually look at survival to neurologically intact discharge, which, as we all know, is, is the real success in terms of cardiac arrest resuscitation. 72-hour survival is just a surrogate endpoint that is really meaningless. Let's take a look at another study here. This is the Airways 2 trial. So there's two groups here. Let's see if they did a better job. Overall, 8.4% uh, survived to 30 days and or discharge in Group A, and 8% survived in to 30 days uh, in Group B, which is not a statistically significant difference. 6.8 had a good neurologic outcome at discharge in Group A versus 6.4 in group B, which is, again, not, not significant in comparison to the difference. Group A had a 79% air success with less than two airway attempts, while group B had a actually significant increase of 87% success with less than two airway, less than or equal to two airway attempts. So it looks as though that group B might be having greater success with their particular method or their particular device. Let's continue looking a little bit deeper here. So group A has only 5% unintended loss of established airway versus 10.6% in group B. So it looks like group A is a little bit harder to establish, but it looks like it's also more secure. Let's keep looking. Group A had a 12.5 regurgitation during or after the procedure compared to 18% in group B. So it would seem that group A has a more secure airway, both in terms of loss of airway patency and preventing regurgitation and aspiration. So what else do we have in this? They also have 7% aspiration during or after uh, versus 9.8% aspiration during or after. So again, it's a better airway as far as uh, security. So let's let's take the blinders off this. Which one is which here? And it may surprise you to find out that group A is the endotracheal tube. So maybe perhaps it's not so surprising finding out that group A is a more secure airway than another method, which in this case is the eye gel or another LMA variant, or as some people may refer to as the, uh, the let me aspirate mask, which... Uh, is uh, not entirely wrong according to the data. So it looks as though the outcomes are fairly similar, although the complications are a little bit fewer as far as regurgitation and uh, you know loss of airway with endotracheal group. So let's take a look at another study that came out recently, the CAM trial. So the CAM trial, group A, had a slightly greater bystander CPR rate, or sorry, bystander witness arrest rate than group B. Okay, so there's a little bit of a difference. Uh, but that's compensated by group B having a higher rate of bystander CPR. So it's probably about a wash. Group A had a slightly greater rate of first shockable rhythm. But otherwise, survival between the two of them with good neurologic outcomes was virtually identical. And looking at difficult airway management, it looks like group A had a little bit more difficulty than group B as far as managing the airway. So it looks like group B had better airway management. And it looks like group B had better outcomes as far as regurgitation, which was almost twice as high, in fact, more than twice as high in group A. So it looks like group A overall had better area management and less complications of regurgitation. So let's take the blinders off of this one. Which one's group A and which one's group B? Well, group A is the BVM only, and group B is endotracheal intubation. So it looks like it doesn't really impact outcomes much, but it does impact things like complications such as uh, regurgitation and aspiration. So what are the takeaways from this? What are the lessons learned? What What's the crux of our argument here? Well, essentially, it comes down to this. Your choice of airway doesn't matter. Uninterrupted chest compressions absolutely do. 
In fact, that's the main focus of high quality resuscitation. Uninterrupted chest compressions are key no matter what airway you use. If an airway is causing greater interruptions in chest compressions, then perhaps that airway is less optimal. But is it the airway or is it the training of the providers? Ultimately, we have to make sure that we don't interrupt chest compressions irrespective of what we use, especially if we're using intubation, because the past practice that had been established had been to interrupt compressions for things such as uh, vent uh, ventilations or establishing that airway. So, why not also do a trial period of aspiration? I mean, if the outcomes are the same, why not let your patient have some aspiration? The endotracheal tube is the most secure airway, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Even though the outcomes are the same, there is a greater instances of the complications such as aspiration regurgitation with these less secure airways. So it's not necessarily a problem with the device. It's more of a problem with the user. So no one is coming for your endotracheal tubes. No one's coming for them. I know there's always concern in the EMS industry of, oh, they're coming for our tubes. But that's not really substantiated. And they've said that they're not coming for our tubes. However, there is something that could happen here. No one's coming for our tubes yet. There are articles already being written that perhaps paramedics should not perform endotracheal intubation. Now, this is a bit of a flawed article based on a flawed understanding of a flawed study, and even the conclusion says, oh, well, maybe we should load and go versus stay and play on scene, which, as we know, that's not best practice and it leads to poorer outcomes. But these are the kinds of articles that are being written. Maybe paramedics should not perform endotracheal intubation. So no one's coming for our tubes yet, but there is some discussion about it. And it's not so much that someone will take our laryngoscope from us. That's, that's not the case. We will lose it due to our inability to perform the skill reliably and successfully. In those two studies that I referenced, they had intubation rates and success rates that were abysmal. 51% uh, in the PART study and 69% uh, in the Airways 2 study. Those are far below the average in the meta-analysis that, that we established. And if your agency has an intubation success rate of 51%, you really need to look at improving providers. And if you're a provider of these agencies and your success rate is poor, you really need to look at what you can do to step up your game. We need to take personal ownership of our profession. You know, this is, these are the tools of our trade and this is what makes a, a difference as far as you know our professional standing we need to take professional pride in how we perform our skills and our proficiency in it master your craft do whatever you're going to do but do it well so the takeaway is your choice of airway doesn't matter whatever it is you do do it well as long as you manage to maintain ventilations ultimately it doesn't really matter what you choose but if you do go down the route of endotracheal intubation, make sure that your skills are, are really top-notch. And if they're not, there are some other options available for assistance. Teleflex does have a cadaver lab that goes around to multiple different cities uh, to provide you with opportunities to, to practice on a cadaver uh, between using the, uh, I believe they use the LMA Supreme as one of their devices and intubation. They also talk about doing the I.O. Granted, it's by a... Uh, a device manufacturer so they do have a vested interest in, in what they're trying to sell you here so take it with a grain of salt but it's a tremendous opportunity and I highly recommend it that if you haven't actually gone to one of these cadaver labs take the time to go to it it's a fantastic opportunity I'll see if I can post a link down uh, in the uh, in the comments below so that you can know where to go to obtain these uh, teleflex cadaver labs so Hopefully that covers some of the grounds as to what airway you should use. The long and short of it is, it doesn't matter which one you choose. But there are some advantages to using the endotracheal tube uh, as far as some complications. But whatever you do, do it well. Master your craft. Until next time, I'm Dominic Wallenzak. Keep thinking differently.